Okay, give me your eyes and ears back this way. Okay, so hopefully this first picture right here is like something you've probably seen, like maybe not even in elementary school, right? In elementary school, I feel like you talk about solids, liquids, and gases. Um, so you should have written left to right just to check. I think we're all good. But the first picture depicts the solid, the second picture depicts a gas, and the third picture depicts a liquid. If you have that in that order, you can give yourself a smiley face. Um, anyone willing to share their logic of why they designated those labels in that way? Yeah, Carter. Are you wanting all three? Like yeah, just do a summary because it's probably somewhat repetitive. Oh, okay. So with the first one being a solid, it was just kind of like all the molecules being like connected. So they were connecting and stuff. So I can't remember the actual word. You're good. Yeah. Good, and I want to show those. So he's kind of going like this with his hands, like showing like they're packed together, right? Yeah, okay, good. Carry all, on. All the connections are like super, super tight, not really allowing it to move at all. And then with gas, it's kind of like they don't have a whole lot of connections, so they're kind of all just a single molecule kind of floating around in space. Good. And then with liquid, they are connected, but like it's super loose, allowing them to move around and still like the container and change its shape. Nice. Good use of words there. Have a smiley face back. So something that I don't know if you've ever like made the connection to, but in terms of the chemistry world, okay, the only difference between a solid, a liquid, and a gas is the distance of the molecules. Like if we can magic school bus down to water, which is what on your desk, who doesn't have a water molecule? Did I miss anybody? Riley, did you get a water molecule? Can you catch water? Anyone else? Oh, Michaela needs some water. Oh, okay, <laughs> Making a mess. Okay, so the only difference, everybody, between water being a gas, water being a liquid, and water being a solid is how close these little things are to each other. Right? It's crazy because on our scale, where we live, with how big we are compared to these, they look very, very different. Right? A solid looks very different from a gas in terms of what they are. But when you get down to the molecular level, that's the only difference, okay? All right, flip your paper to the other side and let's check our dipole answers. Okay, so for carbon dioxide, Benson, I'm gonna pick on you because we talked about it. How do I know which way to point the dipole arrow? Good, so we have a trend of electronegativity which goes from the left to the right upper corner. Whichever one has the higher electronegativity is pulling the electrons towards itself. So in this case, you should have first drawn the arrows going like this, okay? Which means though, in terms of an overall dipole moment or overall polarity, right? They cancel each other out, right? In a sense, it's a tug of war and nothing's going to happen in the tug of war, right? Literally, you can imagine off carbons in the middle Oxygen has one arm, oxygen has the other arm, and they're pulling. But since they're at the same strength, they cancel each other out. So overall, you should have designated this molecule as non-polar. If you did that, go ahead and give yourself a smiley face for that problem. Okay, for water here, actually, I'll leave those up. Okay, in this case, the one with the higher electronegativity is oxygen, so you should have first drawn your arrows like so. But this time, because the shape is bent and not linear, right, they don't cancel each other out, which means you should have said that water is polar. Go ahead and have a smiley face for that, if you got that right. Okay, now let's talk about that last question there, especially because I didn't quite finish typing my full thought in my question. Okay, so here's what I want you to think about, and then I want you to answer it on your own first, so don't talk to anybody, and then we'll kind of discuss it with one another, okay? Water, like your little guys here. Hey, Zach, here, take the water. Oh, here, Zach, take one of these. Okay, so we know that water naturally exists as a liquid at room temperature, right? 
We all know that to be true. Okay, but carbon dioxide naturally exists as a gas. So, fun fact if you didn't know, hi Ben. Dry ice, does anyone know what dry ice is chemically? Awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> True. Anyone know what dry ice is made of? <laughs> no, that's okay. Carbon dioxide. Um, so this is literally what we breathe out, pressed down into a solid. Now, what's happening right now with my dry ice? It's smoking. Smoking. <laughs> So what is that smoke? Wait, but there was some yeah. Yeah. Okay, that is the carbon dioxide turning to a gas. At room temperature, carbon dioxide does not exist as a solid. What temperature do I have to get it to be a solid? It's like, I don't even know. Negative, <laughs> don't quote me on this. Is it on the bag? Nope. Negative, I think 212. Pretty darn cold, that's all I know. Um, pretty much this won't last much longer at room temperature. And it's interesting because it doesn't go through a melting process like most solids would, right? Like ice, if I had water frozen, it would turn to a liquid and then eventually turn to a gas. Carbon dioxide goes straight from a solid to a gas, okay? So here's the question I want you to answer there at the bottom, is why would that be? Knowing what we know about polarity from last time, okay, why does water, a liquid at room temperature, but carbon dioxide is a gas at room temperature, right? Same temperature, same amount of heat, but one is a liquid and one is a gas, okay? So take a moment, don't talk to your neighbor yet, and I just want you to write what you're thinking. I don't care if you're right or wrong, but I just want you to write what you're thinking. Put your pencil down when you're done with your thought. Did I throw you a broken water? Um, this is Ben. Ben, did I give you a broken one? Turn to your table, buddy, and share with them what you wrote. Ready, set, go. <laughs> Okay, let's hear some possible conclusions here, everybody. Okay, I was fine on some of your answers, so I'm going to pick on you to just read what you wrote, okay? Okay, Michaela, will you go first? Sure. Okay, everyone listen to this. This was great. I said one's molecules are more compacted than the other. So, true statement right there. If one is a liquid and one is a gas, what must that mean about the water? They're closer together to each other, right, than the carbon dioxide must be. Good. Have a smile face that. Um, McKay, will you read what you wrote? Perfect. 
Not totally right, but he's getting the concept in terms of there's a distance or compactness thing, right? Good, have a smile face for that. Okay, I want you guys to take your little waters, okay? And if you, some of you have already figured this out, and give your neighbor water molecule a high five. And see what you discover. <laughs> Okay, so what do we notice about our little models here, Jackson? They stick together. They stick together. Okay, give me your eyes up here, everybody. Okay, so we identified here that water is polar, carbon dioxide is nonpolar. From our activity last time, we also could have colored and said, okay, this side of the molecule is negative. And this side of the molecule is going to be positive. Okay? What happens if something that is negative comes in contact with something else that is, or something that is positive comes in contact with something that is negative? Wow. I heard it somewhere back there. They attract. They attract, right? Like magnets. Okay? What we're looking at here is that bond of friendship that we talked about last time, right? That something that exists as a liquid at room temperature has a stronger friendship bond than something that exists as a gas. If I had, I don't because they don't sell them, but if I had little models for carbon dioxide, they wouldn't be magnetic, they wouldn't stick because it's a non polar molecule. So polar molecules are like magnets. And you need to be careful here how I'm saying they're like. They're, we're not saying water is magnetic, right? But it's like a magnet in they have an attractive force to one another. Now I think some of you figure this out. Does it stick anywhere? <laughs> can you get the two white sides to stick together? You try. You can literally feel the repulsion. Right? It's like when you stick your, like, Air, ear pods, air pods together sometimes. And you feel like a magnetic force pushing them away, okay? Um, it links in a very particular manner. And this right here, everybody, this is an intermolecular force. The force between two different molecules. Now, what we're going to learn about today is we're going to learn about three different specific types of intermolecular forces. But what I want you to always come back to is it all comes back to this concept of polarity. Some of them have a lot of polarity, like water, and some have very little polarity, like carbon dioxide, or none. Okay, but the whole concept of the three forces we're learning about today goes back to positive and negatives attract to each other. Any questions that have come to your mind for now? Yeah. Good question, Jameson. It can, but only under very. You're good, you're good. <laughs> Just wave to the camera, it's fine. Um, and I have to look at, I don't even know what it is, under very particular conditions. Um, where at the right temperature and pressure, you can get it to be a liquid. The majority of the time, it just goes, it's called sublimation, it goes straight from a solid to a gas. So. Good question. I'll look up what those are because I know it can be, but I don't remember what. Once again, I guess it'd have to be most of the time in like a controlled lab setting. I don't know if there's anywhere on Earth where it would happen naturally. So, good question. <laughs> Any other questions for now? Okay, make sure your name is on the warm up and slide it to the middle for me.
Okay, before we continue on with our lesson, um, pull out your note packet if it's not out yet. I'm going to have our two new friends, Madeline already introduced herself, but she'll do it again in case you weren't here, um, introduce themselves and who these people in the corner are. And while they're doing that, then I'll take you to the lab and show you what we're going to do. So, okay, take it away. And you can ask them any questions you want after they introduce themselves. What do you want to know about? Hi. So I came last December, so I've been here before, so I recognize me. But my name's um, Madeline or Miss Tolis, whichever you guys prefer. And yeah, I'm from Arkansas. Wow. Do you have any questions? Um, I'm going to be like, you're both going to be like you. And yeah, we want to be scientists. My name's Abilie Ellis. Um, if you want to call me Mrs. Ellis, that's fine, or Abilie, if you can remember. It's kind of a hard name. Um, like she said, we're BYU students. This is our last semester, so we're doing student teaching. So we'll be here till like the middle of April until we graduate. So we're really excited. <laughs> um, and something super exciting is that I'm actually about five months pregnant, so I'm having a little girl. I'm not showing a ton, but a little bit. So no, I wish I was told. <laughs> That's not good. Yeah, it's my first one, but I'm sure I'll start showing more. But yeah, excited about that. What's your favorite color? Mine's unique. Probably green. Yeah, that's actually. That's important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> page of your note packet where you have the I can chart. Okay. And mark off how you feel about I can 6.1. Go to that fastest is what did I miss you can find. 
Okay, so the question is, and something you'll need to be able to do for the test is, can you identify if something is polar? Right, if I give you a molecule, and then can you explain why it's polar? Okay, so give yourself a marking. How are we feeling on that I can for now? Okay, today we're going to be covering the next two I cans, so 6.2 and 6.3. You'll notice that's a pretty short unit. Um, on Friday, we're covering 6.4 and then we're done. Um, so there's not much to this. So if you do have questions about polarity and things, that's kind of the big theme. Today would be the day to ask it, okay? All right, let's talk about our three types and then practice finding them, okay? So first off, definition-wise. I don't think, did we fill in this part yet? I can? Yes. Okay, I'll get you one. Okay, so first off, intermolecular force is the force between two molecules. Okay, once again, we nicknamed it the friendship force. Okay, we're not talking about, if you look at your little water molecule again, this force. Okay, the force to take one of these little white ones off, which can be done, okay, that's the chemical bond. Okay, that's the actual covalent bond between the two of them. We're talking about this force, okay, the force between. Another weird analogy, but it's like the difference of trying to pull off Marin's arm. <laughs> right, that's an actual chemical bond versus just separating her from Emily, who's her friend, okay? So there's still a force there, but in terms of strength, it's not the same as an actual chemical bond, okay? Once again, IMS are the reason why things are solids, liquids, or gases. It's all about how strongly or weak those molecules link up with each other, okay? So it's going crazy. in the word temporary or is it type temporary? Okay, like circle that word temporary. Okay, that's the key part. It's not permanently polar, but here's what happens, okay? Is in a molecule we have electrons. What's the charge of an electron? Negative. Negative, thanks Michaela. Okay, those electrons are moving around because electrons are mobile, okay? So imagine this. 
if we're a molecule and you're all my electrons, and I were to have you stand up right now and just run around the room, okay? And then I said, pause. At that moment, is there a chance that there would be more electrons near the window than, let's say, near the wall? Yeah. There's a chance, right? You're just moving around spontaneously. Well, at that moment, what that would mean is this side of the room would be a little bit more negative, and this side of the room would be a little bit more positive because there's less electrons there, causing a temporary dipole. Now, keep in mind, that's what this picture up here is showing, okay? These are the electrons that when they shift this way, it's negative, and the other side becomes positive. The thing, though, is, is electrons don't ever freeze like that. So they easily can shift back the other way, breaking the dipole. So this is the weakest of all the forces because it's just temporarily there. But all molecules can experience this force. This is why even carbon dioxide can become a solid because of those temporary dipoles holding it together. Now, in order for it to happen, we have to really, really slow them down. That's why it has to be so cold. You have to slow the molecules down because otherwise the, they just spread apart from each other. Questions on the dispersion force for now? Okay, and then our third type of force is known as hydrogen bonding. Um, this is what we call an extreme version of a dipole. So once again, they're all about dipoles. We have dipole, dipole right in the middle. We have temporary dipoles with London. Now we have extreme dipoles with hydrogen bonding, okay? What's happening here is that when we have, is there a picture of water on your paper? Oh, perfect, there is. Okay, I'm gonna draw one, I don't know where mine is. Okay, so when we have our cute little water here, okay, <laughs> draw your dipole arrows like before. Like so. Okay. Now, there's two reasons what causes it to be an extreme dipole, which means it's an even stronger force. Okay, there's two requirements. One, hence the name, hydrogen. Look at the periodic table for me set for a second, everybody. Show me on your fingers how many electrons does hydrogen have? Just show me a one have a smiley face. Yes. Correct. So hydrogen only has one electron, which means if you take away its only electron, what's left? What's left in an atom if you take away its electron? mostly protons and neutrons. So what happens here is this is positive, but it becomes like an extreme, emphasize the positive there, an extreme positive, because that's all that's left, right? It has no other electrons. You've left behind this bare nucleus, okay? The other thing that causes it to be so strong is because of what the hydrogen is bonded to. Okay. The requirement is it needs to be nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine because they have the highest and strongest electronegativity. Okay. The way we talk about it in my AP class is to have a hydrogen bond, you have to have a NA sandwich. Okay. Nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine sandwiched around the hydrogen. What I mean by the sandwich here that for a sec, is, here's another water molecule, that right there is the hydrogen bond. Okay, this so there's your hydrogen, there's your NOx sandwich. Or if you like Oreos better, you can say it's an Oreo. <laughs> You have to have N, O, or F on both sides. One side is truly bonded to create the hydrogen bond. Now, this right here, take your little water molecules again. You can pick them up. This right here is a hydrogen bond, right? This shows that force between 
the extreme dipoles that are happening. Now what's interesting, and we'll talk more about next time, is yes, this force is not a true bond, but it is pretty strong. I would bet that a lot of you have experienced the pain of a hydrogen bond before. If you have ever purposely or not purposely belly flopped into a swimming pool. <laughs> okay, literally imagine a swimming pool or these, okay? The water molecules when you jump into water are playing Red Rover against you. Okay, if you jump in the right way, you can break them apart. But if you jump in a different way, you can literally feel the force of the hydrogen bond. I mean, that's why it's illegal to cliff jump from certain heights at Lake Powell. It's, it could kill you, right? Hydrogen bonding is really, really strong, but it's not as strong as same, once again, as the bond within the molecule. Okay, questions so far? Can I just take these from someone? I have to hold out my cup. Okay, we have a few other of your blanks here. Now, it's important to recognize, and I'll be honest, I don't love that scientists did this. Okay, we call it a hydrogen bond, but it's not a real bond. It's the strongest of the forces, so I'm guessing that's why they call it a bond, but it's just the force between two molecules. Okay, so it's not between atom, it's between molecules. Okay, let's go ahead and summarize our three forces. So this goes with that little table on the top of page, next one, I don't know what page three. Okay, so dipole dipole is a charge attraction between permanent dipoles. It happens between anything that is polar. So the question says, what forces does this have? The first question you need to answer is, is the molecule polar? Because if it's polar, then you know it has dipole forces. Okay, it's the medium strength in our comparison to three, and the closer the molecules can get to each other, the stronger the force can become. All right, London dispersion is a temporary dipole. So it's like a dipole, but it's only temporary, which is why it's the weakest, and everything experiences this force because everything has electrons. So anything with electrons, which is everything on Earth, experiences this type of force. And the more electrons something has because of a greater mass, so this means it has more electrons, Okay, the greater the force will become. This is why it's kind of interesting. If you look at the halogen family, so if you look right here at the halogen family, so all of these exist naturally in nature in different ways. These two are gases at room temperature. This one's a liquid at room temperature, and these ones are solids truly due to the fact that these have a lot more electrons, and so they have a stronger dispersion force. Versus these ones, which are so small, they really aren't attracted to each other. Their friendship is quite weak. They'd rather just be on their own. Okay? All right, and then our last type of force, our hydrogen bonding. So once again, keep in mind the trend of the dipole. Spilling everywhere. Okay? That it's all about the dipole. In this case, it's an extreme dipole. And you need the N to H, O to H, or F to H. And even though it's the strongest of all three, it's still just a pseudo bond. It's not actual chemical bonding. Okay, let's try some practice problems and then we'll jump.
them to our site. Okay, I'm going to do the first. Did not show how I wanted it to. Um, I'm going to do the first two with you to get you started, and then I'll have you. I'll do three, and then I'll have you guys be three. Let's do that since there's six. Okay. Okay. So the question is, what type of force do these things have? Now things can have more than one type of force. Right? Forces can be additive, and it can have all three at times. Okay, so the first column, does the first one say London? Since mine got cut off, LB. Mm -hmm. Okay, looking at your chart up above, what type of molecules experience London forces? So this is an easy point. Put a check mark, a check mark, a check mark, a check mark, a check mark. Everything has London every single time. The answer is always yes. Because it just needs electrons to have London dispersion. So you do, in the box, you either can do a check mark or you can write like yes or no, however you want to distinguish. Okay? Okay, next column says dipole, dipole. So how do I know if something experiences a dipole to dipole force? If it's polar. So coming to the molecule here, okay? Now this is where you've got to take it a little step further because I'm not showing you the 3D shape. Okay, so it's drawn like this, but is it actually look like that? Skeff, you're shaking your head, why? Um, maybe because they're uh, layers. Good, so if you want to draw a picture next to that one showing, I'm going to draw it down here because I can't reach up there. Okay, it actually should be bent like so of that lone pair up at the top. So to determine polarity, you have to know what its 3D shape looks like. The 2D shape can be very misleading if it's polar or not. Okay, now second thing to determine polarity is draw your dipoles. Okay? Does this have a dipole? Why not? They're all the same. Yeah, it's itself, right? So in this case, you can't draw dipole arrows, so is it polar? No, nope. so it can't be dipole dipole. So if you want to make a note to yourself that this is nonpolar, which means it does not have dipole forces. So either put like an X or write no in that box. I wouldn't leave it blank just because when you go back and look, you don't want to like trick yourself of like, why is that blank? Okay. Okay, coming to this guy right here. What's the 3D shape of this gonna look like? There it is, tetrahedral, right, because four-sided, okay? So visualize this as a tetrahedral, okay? But is it perfectly symmetrical? Or I guess draw your dipole arrows, right? They'd all be pointing into carbon, which means they all cancel out, so it is also nonpolar. And nonpolar means no dipole forces. Versus this one right here, okay? We can draw our dipole arrow so it's gonna go like this. But then, because of that fluorine, will the dipoles cancel out? They will not. And so this molecule is polar, which means, yes, it does have dipole dipole. So this is the connection that makes something have dipole dipole polar forces is if it is polar. Questions on determining dipole dipole. Okay, finally, hydrogen bonding. How do I know if something has hydrogen bonding? Look at your list up at the top. Okay, so we need NH, OH, or FH. Okay, well the first one doesn't even have H, so it can't have hydrogen bonding, so that's a no. Second one does have hydrogen, but it doesn't have N, O, or F, so it doesn't have it there. Alright, so no and no. Okay, third one, we have H's, we have F. Good, Jackson, why are you shaking your head? Uh, they have to be bonded directly. Yeah, it has to be connected to each other to cause it to happen, so still no hydrogen bonding. Okay, 
any general questions? Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to try the last three with your table buddy. Once you think you've got it, raise your hand, and then I'll come give you a stamp of approval, and if you're right, then you can get started on tonight's homework assignment, okay? But let's pass off this first to make sure we've got it, okay? Question, Ben? You ready to check it? Okay.